This is Suzanne Arms, and I'm sitting here on a lovely couch on a cold winter day in a little studio above a lake in southwest Colorado. And my purpose today is to start the reading of parts of both of my books called Immaculate Deception, the first of which came out in 1975, and the second of which, Immaculate Deception Two, was a completely different book but a sequel in the same genre and vein that came out in 1994 and then I revised in 1997. I'm told by people all the time, mostly women but sometimes men, that reading the original Immaculate Deception or this newer Immaculate Deception transformed their lives, transformed their personal lives and their professional lives if they're involved in any way in caring for mothers and babies and fathers and families in health care or in education of young children. I am not a professional writer, although I have authored seven books. I am an author, with the distinction being that a writer has to write and will write about most anything that they're paid to write, it's their profession, or that they feel is important to write. I'm an author because I'm someone who is first and foremost um, a visionary, an idealist, a hopeless idealist about how the world could be, and I have a strong, passionate desire to contribute to making this world what it could be, and therefore I'm an agent of change. I use writing when I have to. I use speaking filmmaking, and if I could and probably will, I'll go back to singing and dancing as I did when I was in the theater in college and then again in a dance company in San Francisco in the mid-1960s. So I suppose I'm an artist. But birth is my passion. How we bring human beings into the world, how we care for them, how we care for women how we care for families, the involvement of men, the participation of children and communities in this period of time that has been aptly called the primal period, which really extends from before conception in the woman's body and the man's body as they are preparing, knowing it or not, as their bodies are preparing that egg and those sperm to bring a baby forth, to age one approximately, the in-arms period from birth to about age one. So it goes from preconception to about age one, when the outer world becomes so compelling that the child toddles off or even sometimes runs off away from parents and those that have been caring for him or her into this awaiting, curious world. I started out as a nursery school teacher and then became a Head Start teacher. I thought my passion was children. It wasn't until I gave birth that I realized I had another passion, which was women and the abuse of women and the systematic abuse of women in hospitals unnecessarily and unintended, a system that did not serve birthing women, that was designed by men, unconsciously, in a patriarchal fashion, to keep women subsumed, subservient, passive, and dominated, and to produce children without caring for the real, whole, mind, body, spirit, person, sexual being of the woman. So I started out with an interest in children, which goes back to when I was 10 years old, and I remember thinking I wanted to make the world better for children. And then I moved into wanting to change the way birth happened for women. 
And so my first book of Immaculate Deception, which is actually not my first book, but my first Immaculate Deception, my first book being A Season to be Born, the story of my own pregnancy and birth done with my baby Molly's father, John Arms, who did the photographs. My first Immaculate Deception was subtitled A New Look at Women in Childbirth. It's like, where's the baby? I forgot. And it wasn't for, God, a decade and a half after it came out in 1975 that I came full circle back to seeing that it's really about bringing human beings into the world. And women are the vehicle, the primary vehicle, and the shaper, shapers, and therefore have enormous responsibility and power, unequaled in any other area of life if they only knew it and societies and cultures only treated them that way. But that it's really about children, but that it's really about the human soul and human spirit and the kind of human beings we create. And to the extent that you can never, never do anything good for a, ch a baby without doing something good for its mother, it is about women. It's also about women because it's about their sexuality. And that raises all of the issues about whether a woman has control over her own sexuality and the right to choose not to bear children or when to bear children and how to bear children and the quality of experiences that she wants to have for herself as well as for this child. And then... Late in the 90s, I started to see it as a family issue and a community issue, going back full circle to when I was studying anthropology and what cultures did around the world in preliterate societies and in indigenous land-based societies, tribes and villages, and how much of their innate wisdom and learned wisdom was still of value today began to connect with my passion for expressing in lay terms the best of scientific evidence and problem solving for modern human beings, all combined with human intuition and the language of the heart. So I began to see just before the turn of the this last century the very end of the 1990s, that really it's about so much more than just birth and so much more than just the primal period and so much more than just the baby, the mother, the father, the family. It's about creating thriving communities and societies on this planet and resilient human beings who can live from a state of deep trust and knowing of their own nature, connection to this earth, deep connection to other people and a sense of trust in them and in the world that allows them to really experience life fully, wholeheartedly, with joy, curiosity, eagerness to resolve problems and to participate with others and all forms of life in living better on this planet. So, dear listener, that brings you and me up to about 2000, which is just about the time when the scientific revolution occurred in cell biology, neurophysiology, brain development, and more recently, the field of epigenetics, how environment shapes and alters genes and our biological blueprint that we come into the world with as potential to manifest the kind of human beings that we actually become, because it is a, a real blending of nature and nurture. <clears throat> so... I didn't really start to get eagerly involved with pre- and perinatal psychology and health and reading about 
all of the advancements in the understanding of the human brain and the development of the human brain and attachment theory, and which we now call bonding, um, until around 2000. This world of science and of practical evidence about what it takes to grow or to rear a healthy mind and a healthy, happy, resilient human being is a very exciting one. And it really has yet to filter down to the general public or even to the field of birth and the primal period as it is practiced in this country, much less filtered down to child care practices, educational practices, health policies <clears throat> related to mothers and fathers children and families. So that's where we are today. And I am sitting here with the first Immaculate Deception on my lap, one that I bought off of the internet, used, and I see that it was originally part of the reference collection of the Department of Population Planning at the School of Public Health, the University of Michigan. I found that Immaculate Deception made its way into many corners of education in this society. Um, <clears throat> the professor at Brandeis, Maury, and I can't remember his last name, who's the subject of Tuesdays with Maury, the book and the Broadway play that, about this incredible professor who changed the lives of so many college students for decades found the way into his class when I went to speak at Brandeis University and uh, he was in the audience and afterwards made Immaculate Deception required reading for his class in what I think was sociology. So anyway, it's a long way around uh, to tell you that I am an author, I am somebody who cannot help but tell you about what I have found to be important and exciting. And it all goes back to the beginning, just as the roots of a plant are either planted deeply in the soil and the seed was watered well and had enough sunlight and warmth for those roots, those shoots to become good roots so that we could get a strong, resilient, healthy plant, tree, mm, squash, whatever, or it is not. And the seeds and the roots that we set down at the beginning shape the rest of our lives. So as far as I'm concerned, this becomes the most critical issue of all times. If we're going to deal with population planning and uh, the role of women and the power of women in societies and um, stopping the neglect and abuse of children and the hurting of animals in this earth and population issues as they relate to global warming and the use of resources and so on. We always come back to what kind of human beings make these decisions, what kind of human beings have lived without much consciousness in many ways on this planet and what's required to have a better quality human being. We always come back to the beginning. One mother, one baby, one father, one family, one community, one neighborhood, one village, um, and how we care for people at their most dependent time in life. Um, and I mean not only the dependency of babies, because human babies are born so prematurely in comparison to large mammals like horses and and uh, cows or even kitties, um, they are very dependent, but so are women in childbearing. And they need the support of society, and they need all kinds of good things to keep their body, mind, and spirit up so that they can really do this amazing work of growing a human being and developing every organ in it and its brain and nervous system out of their own flesh, out of their own spirit, 
out of their own imagination in their bodies with the aid of the quality of the male sperm, of the quality of the father who is hopefully deeply involved in this, and the participation of her partner or husband and family in this work of growing a human being. That's a long-winded way of getting me to the point where I want to start reading from Immaculate Deception. Now, I made a decision to do this because so many people have lots of driving time in cars where they have nothing to do but listen to good music or books on tape. And many people have told me that um, Immaculate Deception changed their lives, and I presume because the information in it is as current as you can imagine. Uh, In many ways, so many things are different, but nothing has significantly changed in this field. Um, I believe that this book might be of value to you or your daughter or your friend who's going to have a baby or a high school student who does child care or your nanny or a class in sex ed or a college class in sociology. When I, um, as I open with the preface, when I first had the inspiration to write this book, it was an urge. Uh, My daughter was just a few months old, and I was still reeling from the kind of birth that she and I had had, which was very traumatic. Not the birth that I had hoped for and planned, but very much the birth that I had been set in motion to have from my own birth unbeknownst to me, because I didn't know that the seeds of how one births are set in how one was birthed or how one birthed oneself from one's mother. So I had this urge, and the urge was to study birth and study what was going on because I couldn't understand why what had happened to me had happened, why it was so unnatural, why it was so shocking. And was it happening to other people? Yes, because I found that out from everybody I talked to. And why was it happening to so many women? And even in the best of medical centers, and I went to one that was designed for natural childbirth, supposedly, this hospital in San Francisco that had the only practice of natural childbirth doctors. And I had this sense of urgency, and I happened to live in Marin County, California, where home birth was on the rise and um, under the radar, and a group of people called midwives, women, were attending the births of friends and neighbors without the benefit of having gone to nursing school or medical school and coming at it from many different forms of self-education and training. And so this book originally was not even going to be called Immaculate Deception. It was going to be called the midwives. And I put it together, the proposal, on big boards, about 11 by 14, with photographs of mine and words, and I was ready to take it to New York City and to bring it to the offices of publishers and see if I could sell it. But of course, and this is a little bit of an interesting digression, I was going to New York City with my daughter, who was then... Oh, it's 1972, so she would have been almost two, and uh, a year and a half. And I got on the airplane and left the big rucksack that was carrying this big set of boards, this proposal, this visual proposal, in the airport in San Francisco. And that proposal, which was the only copy I had of it, and I were not reunited for three months. So I went to New York without the proposal and tried to talk my way through. Anyway, this is the preface that I wrote in late 1974, just before the book was published in the spring of 1975. Like thousands of women in America today, I had hoped and prepared for a natural birth. And like thousands of others, the birth of my child was a product 
not of my own efforts, but of medical science and all the latest, quote, improvements that hospitals can provide. Strangers appeared and reappeared to examine me internally while I focused my attention on breathing, because I had taken natural childbirth classes, which were the only ones available at the time. Sedatives were administered without my knowledge or my consent, and that is true beginning with when the nurse slapped me on the arm as she welcomed me to the hospital labor and delivery unit in the basement of a French hospital in San Francisco and stuck a needle with a sedative in as she remarked, my, you're tense. While I focused my total attention on breathing, sedatives were administered without my knowledge or consent. A caudal, which was an early version of what we now know as a as epidural anesthesia, was incorrectly uh, inserted and later removed because it dripped blood. Actually, it took him 13 t- attempts to put the needle in my spine properly, and the anesthesiologist, who was having a bad day, finally stormed out of the room, threw the needle across the room before he did so, and came back a half hour later and apologized that he and his wife had had an argument and uh, it was just having a bad day. Labor stopped completely from that caudal, In fact, it didn't just stop completely. It started feeling like a sense of burning up my legs all the way up my thighs to my hips until the staff was very frightened by what was going on and and then pulled it out. Um, Pitocin wafers were placed next to my gums in quantities that should have started labor in a horse but didn't start mine. And uh, Pitocin in those days was a, a form that was taken off the market, as was the caudal, for not being as effective and safe as hopeful, but as hoped for, but the caudal uh, was replaced by another form of anesthesia, and pitocin was replaced by an IV drip. Uh, buckle meant it was put up against the gums, and there was no way of knowing how much would directly get into the bloodstream, and nobody knew then that it went directly to the baby. So. Pitocin wafers were placed next to my gums in quantities that should have started labor in a horse but didn't restart mine. Now, I had gone to the hospital because my waters had broken. My membranes had, quote, ruptured uh, about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'd made a lovely dinner for John and myself, a fresh filet of sole, which in those days didn't have a lot of mercury, and it was a marvelous dinner. I sauteed it with butter and garlic in a pan, and we packed up and took off across the Mount Tamalpais um, and across the Golden Gate Bridge into San Francisco about 11 o'clock. Not because my labor had started, it hadn't, but because that was the practice in those days was to come in when your le- membranes had ruptured. But I had a nice, generous, um, progressive-minded physician who suggested that I have dinner first, relax, and then come in late at night. At any rate... After 20 hours of labor, which had been started artificially after I got to the hospital, and three shifts of hospital attendance, about 21 hours, I was finally wheeled into delivery, completely exhausted, frightened, and ready for anything the doctor had to offer me to get out of the experience forever. A lengthy incision was made, that's called an episiotomy, then forceps were used. A historical note, episiotomy, cutting through the vaginal tissue called the perineum at the bottom of the vagina to enlarge the outlet for the baby to come through and cutting through muscles and nerves, um, was done on approximately 90% of women birthing in hospitals in 1970-75. Today that number is much lower. Forceps were used for perhaps 20-30% of births. Today, forceps are hardly ever used, but we do have vacuum extraction, which is exactly as it sounds, a very rough entry for a baby being pulled out by suction. However, forceps and vacuum are both going out of fashion because cesarean is has rapidly become the way for women to give birth if they're not going to have a completely natural birth with very few women have. I came out of delivery numb from the waist to the knees. That's still true with 
Epidurals, dry and sour in the mouth, flat on my back and strapped to a metal table four feet off the ground. Still true for many, many births around the world. For three years I could not shake the feeling that I had failed. Somehow it seemed as though I had lacked courage, faith, and determination to give birth naturally without, quote, help from drugs or machines. In a sense, this was true, for like many other women, I had walked into the hospital unconsciously expecting my baby would be delivered to me by the doctor and his staff. I can't tell you how many women actually believe that, that this baby is going to be delivered to them, and um, that they are going to put themselves in the hands of the so-called experts, and they and the baby will be brought through this harrowing experience in good shape. Thinking back now, it seems odd. It seems I was only a child at the birth of my own baby, dependent upon a greater authority to shield me from the intensity of the experience and my own fear of the unknown. But it wasn't until I finally got up the nerve to question my doctor about it that I realized that an entire system of medical procedures and interferences had been established long before to treat normal birth as a risky, painful, dangerous, and abnormal process in which pregnant women have no choice other than to submit graciously. And I'd like to add here that the whole field of hospitals offering childbirth education classes, which started in the early 1970s, started as a direct result and counter-assault on this grassroots movement for birth education to basically strip away this grassroots movement wanted to strip away all of the fear, the unnatural fear that women, modern women, had grown up with and learned so that they could allow their body to do what it already knew how to do and their baby to do what it already knew how to do, which was to birth normally. And hospitals realized there was money to be made in having classes on their own turf and to have them taught by employees or outside people who would follow their rules, and that these classes could actually serve the purpose of creating more compliant patients. So that by offering them free, kind of like a cheap, uh, a, a cheap product in a store to get people in the store, you would get compliant patients who wouldn't fight with hospital policy. I didn't know that until Kitty Ernst told me about it, a very wonderful, pioneering nurse midwife, former director of the American College of Nurse Midwives, who also founded and was director for the Association for Creating and Licensing Birth Centers in this country. There's so many things historical that unless we understand them, we cannot really appreciate uh, how things have evolved the way they are, and how much we've lost in the process. To get back to my preface, since then I've spent many hours listening to other women recall their own birth experiences, and I'd say thousands of women in on four continents I have researched and listened to and taken copious notes from, and photographed in many cases. Most mothers are eager to share the smallest and most intimate details of their experience, and initially they describe their births as good and satisfying. This is still true today. Most women do not want to reflect upon how unpleasant an experience it was for them and how deeply dissatisfying it was. And many feel guilty at some deep level that they've betrayed themselves by allowing things to happen and by turning this process over to so-called outside experts. And it's not so easy to get women to share their birth stories today unless you're very careful in approaching them with a complete lack of judgment and a sense that they feel that you care deeply about them and their experiences. But with rare exception, Women who have given birth in hospitals become upset the longer they talk about it. True, true, true. It couldn't be more true. They recount incident after incident of loneliness, fear, frustration, humiliation, loss, and a deep and guilt-ridden belief that they have missed the most profound experience of their lives. 
And this comes at a very bodily, sensate level because deep within ourselves is this awareness that we are in, must, we are intended to complete these important sexual processes. And birth is a profoundly sexual experience. And we are to complete them in order to feel the deep satisfaction that they bring. Not a few of them cry, and many admit that they've never shared these feelings with anyone before, and I'd like to tell you a little anecdote. A few years after Immaculate Deception came out, and I was still studying birth practices, and at this time, by that time, also speaking to people around the world, I was in England, and I was brought to dinner by a young then radical midwife, and there was an association of radical midwives that came out of England from the late 1970s, trying to change birth practices there. And this woman named Pippa, lovely red-haired young midwife, brought me to her family to have Sunday dinner. Now, at that time, I was traveling with my then partner, who was an obstetrician. And one of those rare obstetricians who loves palling around with home birth people and natural birth uh, advocates and midwives. And uh, he, at one point, had been backing births, home births, for midwives in five counties in the Bay Area and near San Francisco because he really believed in the ability of women to birth normally and naturally. This man's name is Don Creevy, and I want to give him credit for so much because he protected so many women from unnecessary intervention at the very time when he was also uh, practicing at Stanford University Medical Center and training physicians and doing very unusual births there because he really believed that women could birth naturally and normally. But that's another story. So here we are at this dinner table, and I was there with Don, and the uh, father of Pippa, was a hospital physician. I can't remember what field he was in. Could have been pediatrics. And his wife had been a nurse. I got talking, as I tend to, about birth at this lovely table when we were having this marvelous uh, roast beef and Yorkshire pudding dinner. And uh, suddenly, Pippa's mother started to talk excitedly about her birth. And as she talked, she started to get very angry. And she started to tell the story of how her husband, Pippa's father, had dropped her off at the hospital at the births of each of her children and walked away. And he had never set foot in the labor room, even though, of course, as a doctor on staff there, he could have. And the anger in her voice started to rise. And then from the head of the table, Pippa's father literally stood up, shook his fist and said, I will not have you upsetting my wife like this. And she turned on him and said, I will talk about this and she will upset me. And I will tell you what it was like for me or words to that effect. I was so stunned, I practically fell out of my chair. That is an example of what happens when women start to talk deeply about the experience they missed giving birth to their child or all of their children that was possibly and could have been the most transformative and empowering experience of their lives. To go back to my preface, and it doesn't go much longer. Today, scientists are beginning to report evidence that supports what many women have felt for generations, that where and under what conditions a woman gives birth greatly affects the course of her labor, the normalcy of her delivery, the health of her baby, and the lifelong relationship of mother and child, and today I would add, and her sense of herself as a mother, as a woman, and her deep sense of confidence or lack of it. Women have always felt the need to find a, quote, safe place for birth, safe from harm and disturbance, what French physician, surgeon, obstetrician Michel Audin refers to as a secure place. The hospital, we have been assured, is that safe place, but we are beginning to wonder. 
Now, that was written in 1974. Many years have gone by, and very little has changed. Lots and lots of evidence has grown and mounted into piles that should have resulted in changes and transformation of the entire system. But it's a deeply entrenched system, and there's a lot of money to be made off of it. And there's a lot of fear among those in the system about change and a lot of unwillingness to let go of control and power. The pregnant woman in America, I wrote, today actually knows little more about her coming birth than the child in the street, and that is still true. Even the woman who comes with a business degree and runs a corporation and brings a textbook on obstetrics to her prenatal visit with her obstetrician and chats with him about the risk factor of uh, amniotic embolism. I mean, you know, something that can happen in one out of every 10,000, 20,000 births because she wants to uh, understand this process at an intellectual level, but she really knows little more about her coming birth than the child in the street because she hasn't gotten the most important piece, which is that birthing is something innately, deeply embedded in the knowing of every woman at the cellular level and at the baby at the cellular level and comes from the ancient brain and educating her prefrontal neocortical area of the brain is not going to necessarily make her birth any easier or less problematic and is much more likely to keep her in the wrong part of her brain and cause problems. The pregnant woman in America can probably recount many stories about other people's births, including at least one chilling tale of a friend who supposedly, quote, wouldn't be alive today if it hadn't been for a quick-thinking obstetrician who intervened to save the day. And I would add, she now knows many women with the same story, and their baby, as they say it, wouldn't be alive today without that cesarean, without that doctor, without that hospital. Knowing what I now know, I'd want to go to her chart, and I'd want to actually read her medical records and get a sense of what happened that might have made that birth so problematic that she or the baby needed to be rescued from a process that is designed to be successful if the mind gets out of the way, the fear doesn't impose itself, and the woman is in a very quiet, calm, and non-interventive and supportive environment. But information about what really goes on inside the hospital stops at the front door. In making this book, I've tried to show what has happened to birth in American hospitals, what we have lost in our national push for progress, and what alternatives to current practice still exist. Childbirth, I wrote, is one of the most profound personal experiences a woman can have. And of course, I didn't know this personally because it wasn't that for me. I knew this from observing other women's really fine births and really awful births and talking to women. Yet our present system of uniform care does not allow her the freedom to choose her own way of birth and reclaim the experience as her own. This is a book about childbirth in America. It is neither a medical textbook nor a political treatise nor a whole birth catalog. Rather, it's a statement that grew out of my need to understand and explain my own birth experience. It is my contribution to anyone interested in the American way of birth. Now that ends my preface, and I must say that in the time since I wrote that, this westernized, medicalized, hospital, technologically, pharmaceutically dependent approach to birth has spread across the world, very aggressively marketed, because there's a lot of money to make, be made in the drugs and the equipment and in the professionals themselves. So that it now is true that 30 to 40 to 50 percent of women in Greece, in the island of Bali, in Indonesia, in many cities around the world, and certainly in Brazil, Uruguay, Central America, Mexico, that 30 to 50% of these women 
are birthing by scheduled cesarean section without any labor, without their baby ever experiencing the contractions that it needs to stimulate and waken up, waken the nervous system to this huge learning spurt that is meant to occur as it emerges from the mother's vagina out into the world and transforms itself in a matter of minutes and hours from a an aquatic and water being, an aquatic water being tethered to the mothership by this placenta through which it gets oxygen and food and nourishment of all kinds to an, an organism that can breathe on its own, sustain its own temperature, and feed from the breast. So what we have done in terms of damaging birth around the world cannot even be quantified in numbers. What we've done by <clears throat> what we've done by causing women around the world, especially in the so-called developing world, the urbanizing world that comes out of a village land-based world. Um, what we have done to these women is give them and the health professionals who work with them the belief that modern hospitals, drugs, technology, um, and practices that are interventive in the biological, physiological process of birth are essential to the health and well-being of themselves and their child, just as bottle feeding and infant formula are essential and are going to produce a baby that looks as good as a blonde white baby across the ocean. It's a terrible, terrible state of affairs. But I'm talking to you today as a teenager, a young woman, a woman who may have delayed her childbearing into her mid or late 30s or early 40s, as a grandmother, as a health professional, as a potential father, as a grandfather, as anyone who cares deeply about the state of this earth and humanity on it. I'm talking to you because I want you to understand first and foremost what it's done to you, this modernization of birth that has turned birth much the same way as the family farm has been turned into an agribusiness, it's turned birth into big business, where there's lots of money to be made, and where the primary concern for the well-being of the mother, the baby, the father, the family, takes a back seat. Whew, I haven't read that preface in many years, and... Uh, I'm reminded of how young I was emotionally when I wrote it. 1974, I was born in 1944, so that I was 30 years old. I had a college degree with an honors in English, with a minor in cross-cultural studies and anthropology. I should have known a lot more, but I didn't. I was educated in the upper prefrontal lobes, but... I had been trained and educated out of my gut and my instincts and my best sense of knowing. And I'm wanting to help bring you back into that. And there are many other authors, um, from Ina Mae Gaskin, the now world-famous midwife, to Robin Lim, who recently won the CNN Hero of the Year Award for the work she's been doing in Bali for many years, an American Filipino-American woman. Um, many, many people have been writing books about natural, normal birth and how to have it uh, and how to strip away this unnatural and excessive uh, level of fear that we come to birth with. Men as well as women, doctors and nurses certainly, as well as the lay public. And I have to tell you that during my pregnancy, I learned, for example, the startling fact that my umbilical cord was not attached to the baby's umbilical cord on the inside. That's what I thought. I thought that somewhere in my body, the baby's umbilical cord was attached to 
the inside of my umbilical cord. <laughs> now, you don't have to know a lot of physiology to understand that you can birth normally and spontaneously and well without outside intervention and that there is time to get help if you need it, if you stay in touch with your body and you have people around you who are skilled and know how to read the signs with you. But it gives you a little bit of a sense of how much uh, ignorance there is about birth. We're ignorant of the fact that drugs affect baby. We're, we're ignorant of the fact that if a woman has a cup of coffee, the baby who is 10 to 20 times smaller than the mother, weighs one-tenth to one-twentieth of this mother that this baby is living within, is getting 20 times, 10 or 20 times, the amount of caffeine that the mother is getting in that one cup of coffee. We, we don't know this. We've gotten so used to living in a pharmaceutical culture and a culture where we have denied ourselves the experience of effort and in many cases um, important effort, such as labor, um, that we think that nothing that the mother takes in is going to get to the baby to harm it. And many medical professionals will still tell you that an artificially induced labor is exactly the same produces exactly the same contractions as a natural, normal labor. And they, they believe it. But they've never experienced it, the two. Any woman who's had both, uh, an artificially induced or artificially stimulated uh, labor, will tell you if she's also had one where she had the natural biological, physiological rhythm of her contractions, that the two contractions are totally different. One rises and peaks and falls like a wave and rests, gives you a period of rest in between because labor is not one continuous intense contraction. It rises and f crests and goes down the other side and you can learn to slide down as you would ski down a mountain. And the other is like chasing a bus down the street that you can never catch up with because an artificially stimulated, artificially induced labor actually results in contractions where the contraction reaches a peak but never slides down fully to a resting place. The uterus never lets go of its contraction so that it retains a high level of tension even after the contraction. And that means the woman can't rest. That means the woman is like, to feel a lot of actual pain. So in this book, Immaculate Deception, I sought to tell American women, and now I could say it's around the world, women and men, medical professionals, health professionals, educators, public health people, as well as the lay public, teenagers, young women, college students, business people, that we have really taken the wrong path, that everything that is done in birth today on a routine basis in hospitals has, in fact, no medical scientific basis for being done except on a very tiny number of women and babies who have serious complications, if those. And it is my hope that you will find this reading as exciting as I found the research when I was in the basements of medical libraries uh, researching the history of childbirth or at the card catalogs in the days before computers madly sorting through the cards on the anthropology of birth and the psychology of birth and the sociology of birth and the economics of birth, the physiology of birth, because everything about birth was divided into all these different fields and it wasn't in any one place that I could even find it. Now, in this series of CDs and recordings, what I'm going to be doing is weaving back and forth between the first Immaculate Deception and the second Immaculate Deception called Immaculate Deception 2. And um, I'll be doing that and avoiding some of the parts that I think are either poorly written or in my first book or um, out of date now because a lot of the evidence has changed in different areas. 
and then focusing on parts that I think would be of real value to you today. But I want to repeat, many, many things are different about birth, but almost nothing has significantly changed. I want to make a very special, special statement to men, to fathers, as well as those young men, older men who are not fathers, as well as those men who are both fathers and in the health professions and who may be working in childbirth or with pediatrics. It's very important that you understand that birth is critically essential to who you are, how you were born, how you were conceived, how healthy your mother's body, mind, spirit, and emotions were right from before conception as her egg was preparing to drop down and potentially create you and be fertilized, has shaped who you are, how she carried you in her womb all those months, how she birthed you, and how she nurtured you, or someone else did because she wasn't there to do it, chose not to, could not to, was dead, whatever, have shaped the person that you are. And in fact, it's easier to talk to men about birth than it is about to talk to women about birth because men don't have this extra layer of fear that women do because it's not happening in their bodies. But you are so, so connected to this process. So, dear man, dear young man, I hope that you'll continue to listen to this story. Birth is an experience that has shaped all of our lives. Every single human being who's been on this planet and the primal period, that time from preconception, as your mother's body and father's body were preparing to conceive you, to age one, are critically important to the human being you are today, to the hopes, the fears, the self-doubts, the confidence that you have. For that reason, whether or not you ever plan to have children, whether you've made sure you will never have children, whether your children have grown up and have lives of their own and you are in your elder years, this should matter to you. 